And when one is engaged in other activities, then one practices mindfulness and full awareness, or better, mindfulness and clear comprehension. That is, being mindful in all the various activities and being fully aware or having a clear understanding of what one is doing when walking, returning, looking up, looking to the side, when bending and stretching the limbs and so on, and in all the different positions, walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking, and keeping silent. Richard, did you have to add that? Yeah, what is sleeping mindfully? <laughs> well, basically it means that one goes to sleep mindfully, um, and it's said that if one is very diligent and very uh, accomplished in the practice of mindfulness, then one could even maintain the mindfulness during the sleep. <laughs> Doesn't that mean one really isn't asleep? No, no. Does it, what does it mean? I think in ordinary terms, let us say that one falls asleep mindfully, so that when one lies down, one is aware of lying down, and as one drifts off to sleep, one is mindful as drifting off to sleep. But in my own experience, <laughs> if one is going to fall asleep, one has to, in a sense, loosen up the mindfulness, not hold it too tightly. Because if one tries to press the mindfulness, as one is sort of drifting off to sleep, it'll keep one from falling asleep. Yeah, so he says, in the middle watch of the night, we will lie down on the right side, in the, li in the lion's pose, one foot on top of the other, mindful and fully aware, after noting in our minds the time for rising. So it's not saying that one actually maintains the mindfulness during sleep, but one goes to sleep, goes to bed, maintaining the mindfulness and clear comprehension, and then one makes the mental note as one lies down that one is going to wake up wake up at such and such a time when one gets a sufficient amount of rest so that one doesn't just continue to lie in bed after the time for waking up goes by. Okay, so then we come to the section on abandoning the five hindrances. This I dealt with in detail last week. And so here the Buddha is describing the monk who goes off into a solitary place and then sits down and abandons each of the five hindrances, here called covetousness, or elsewhere called sensual desire, and ill will, and sloth and torpor, or dullness and drowsiness, restlessness and remorse, and doubt. Okay, so then the Buddha ends this passage by saying that he has the simile of five types of constrictions or constraints, being in debt, being ill, being in prison, being a slave, and being um, walking across a desert. Um, yeah, walking across a desert without knowing where one is going. And so when, when one abandons the five hindrances, then the Buddha says one sees oneself as, one sees that condition as freedom from debt, as good health, as release from prison, freedom from slavery, and as having reached a place of safety. Okay, so this much is what we dealt with last week. And now we come to a section on the five, four jhanas. These are 
meditative states of deep concentration or samadhi which are reached when the five hindrances are abandoned and the meditator wants to go into deeper samadhi. And so we have two terms here. One term is samadhi and the other term is jhana. And now there are different approaches to the development of meditation. At the point when the five hindrances are abandoned, one approach, which has become very widespread today in today's world, is the approach of what is called sometimes dry or simple insight meditation. And so when one overcomes the five hindrances, one gains a certain degree of samadhi. The mind, as the five hindrances are abandoned, the mind becomes collected. This is the meaning of samadhi. The mind, which is literally, it means put together. Or we could say even composed or collected. But most translators now use the word concentration. Okay, so when the mind is concentrated in samadhi, sufficient degree of samadhi, one can then turn directly to the practice of insight meditation by observing the arising and passing away of phenomena. It could be the basing oneself on the breathing, one can note the alternation of in-breath, out-breath, in-breath, out-breath, or one can note the rising and falling of the abdomen, or one can move into the walking meditation and just note right step, left step, right step, left step, and then one can start to note these processes at subtler and subtler levels with finer and finer subdivisions. And so in this way one will be getting keener insight into the impermanence of bodily and mental processes. So that is the approach of what is called simple or dry insight. The other approach is the approach of developing strong samadhi first and then using that strong samadhi as a basis for insight. And to develop the strong samadhi, the meditator cultivates these four levels of mental concentration, which are called the jhanas. And so what happens as the mind starts to become concentrated is that a certain object appears before the mind. It's usually an object like a point of light or a ball of light which is experienced in different ways depending on the particular mental formations of the meditator, depending on the meditation subject. But for example, if one is doing mindfulness of breathing in the area where one experiences the breath, the sensation of the breath, this point of light or circle a sphere of light starts to appear. It might be white, could be pinkish, red, 
light blue. And then the meditator will focus the mind, to let the mind sink into that light. Technically, the light is called nimitta. Nimitta simply means something like an object, but it's this special object that appears through the development of concentration. Okay, so the meditator focuses on this nimitta, this ball of light, point of, point of light. And as the meditator is focusing on the nimitta, certain mental factors start to become more prominent in the mind. First, there are two factors which work closely together. It's hard to find really satisfactory translations for them in English. In Pali, we call them vitaka and vichara. The word vitaka, in ordinary usage, means thought or thinking. But it also has the sense of the application of the mind to the object. It's sometimes compared to maybe using a hammer to hit a nail through a board, except when it's not using the mind forcefully, but when it's sort of gently and softly applying the mind to the object. So that mental application to the object, or directing the mind to the object, or mounting the mind on the object. That is the work of vitaka, which here we translate applied thought. Along with vitaka, there is another factor involved, which in Pali is called vichara. Here it's translated sustained thought or examination. But, again, vichara isn't really thinking discursively the way we ordinarily do. But rather, vichara is the factor which we might even call it observation of the object. Not analyzing, not trying to develop wisdom out of the object, but just observing the object examining the object. And it's said that vichara places a continued pressure on the object or it keeps the mind anchored on the object. Okay, so now as vitaka and vichara are able to remain steadily and sustained on the object, the mind feels as though it's cut or one feels as though one's mind has come into a clearing. It's like going through the jungle of forest of wandering thoughts. And now one has come into this clearing where the mind is able to sustain itself consistently on the object. And so this brings a great sense of purity, of inner freedom. And with this, there arises a kind of joy, a joy that becomes more and more intense to the level where it can be translated as rapture. This state of joy or rapture in Pali, it's piti, which originally has the sense of refreshment, 
It's a kind of refreshing of the mind. As though, you know, in India, the weather is often hot, and so it's like a hot person diving into a cool pool of water in the middle of the day. The body feels so cool, so refreshed, so relieved of all of the heat and weariness and sweat from walking in the hot sun. And this joy, it's not like our ordinary joy if we get the Christmas present we want or a delicious meal on Thanksgiving, but it's more like, even like a physical sensation, a kind of blissful sensation, both mental and physical sensation that runs through the whole mind and body. And then accompanying this joy or rapture is a state of mental pleasure. This is not the coarse pleasure like sensual pleasure, but it's a pleasant, easeful, comfortable feeling. And this is what is called in Pali Sukha. So we have these four factors in this state of the jhana, but these four factors which are building up and leading to the jhana. That is, we have the workers, you could say the two workers are applied thought and sustained thought. They are the ones that have the responsibility of focusing the mind on the object and sustaining the mind on the object. And then the two rewarding factors, the factors that experience the reward, are rapture, piti, and this pleasure or happiness, sukha, blissful happiness. And then going along with them is the fifth factor, which is called one-pointedness of mind. In pa the Pali word is ekagata. Eka means one. Aga means a point. And so ekagata is unification of mind on the object. Like all of the scattered, dispersed streams of thought are now collected and brought to bear on the object. And so the mind remains fixed, unified, one-pointedly on the object. And as these five factors gather strength, a certain point is reached where the mind goes from the level of ordinary mind into the level of the first jhana a completely different state of mind in which sensory experience falls away and the mind remains steady on the object. Even though first, when one first achieves the jhana, it might just be for a few seconds, but the mind has reached a new level. It's not a level of insight, wisdom, or enlightenment, but it's a level of concentration. And so, according to the way of explaining the first jhana, it has, this is according to the analysis of the Abhidhamma, it has these five jhana factors. Vitaka, vichara, piti, sukha, chitase, kapita. That is, apply thought, sustained thought, rapture, pleasure, and one-pointedness of mind. Okay, we find this described here in the sutta, here on, in, on page 367, paragraph 15. This is the standard text on the four jhanas. Having abandoned these five hindrances, imperfections or defilements of the mind 
that weakened wisdom, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states of mind, that is, now the mind is left behind the five hindrances and all other unwholesome mental qualities, he enters and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Then to describe the state further, the text says, he makes the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion, drench, steep, fill and pervade this body so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Okay, then, then to illustrate this, the text uses a simile. Maybe it's not so familiar to us nowadays because we have these spray cans in which all the work is done for us, spray cans of shaving cream. Just as a skilled bathman or his apprentice heaps bath powder in a metal basin and then sprinkles it gradually with water and kneads it until the moisture wets his bowl of bath powder soaks it and pervades it inside and out, yet the ball itself does not ooze. So we can even think of a ball of a shaving cream if you uh, squeeze it out from this spray can. You get a ball of the shaving cream and it's wet, but you can't separate the water from that soapy substance. But Wherever there is the soapy substance, the water pervades it, and wherever there is liquid wetness, it's pervaded by that soapy substance. So the two are just perfectly mingled. And so in the same way, the monk makes that rapture and pleasure, born of seclusion, drench and so forth, this body, so that the whole body is pervaded by that rapture and pleasure. Okay, at this point I'll ask whether there's any questions so far on anything that's been said before we go further. Should we move on? Okay, so now this first jhana is a very, you know, you can see it's a very blissful, very uplifting state, but the Buddha doesn't stop here. In this sutta, he wants to show the whole sequence of the states of samadhi. And so he's going to move now through the three higher jhanas. Okay, so now to move on before moving on to the second jhana, what the meditator has to do is first to master the first jhana. But doesn't just gain the first jhana tempor you know, temporarily and then think, ah, now I can move on to the second jhana. But rather what one has to do is to master it. To master it means that one has to be able to enter it again and again until one gets familiar with it. Maybe it's a little bit like a child or a student who learns who's learning arithmetic and once he learns to multiply he learns the multiplication tables, 9 by 6 equals 54. 
9 by 7 equals 64. 63. <laughs> 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 I was just testing to see if anybody was correct. <laughs> I lost to it.
and sustain thought fall away and one enters the second jhana in which there's still rapture, there's still happiness, and there's necessarily this mental unification or one-pointedness of mind, but there's no more disturbance by thought and examination. So the text says here on paragraph 16, again, with the stilling or quieting down of applied thought and sustained thought, the bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence. I think that's not such a good rendering here. Um, because self-confidence usually means, you know, like, when I get up on, before an audience, I don't feel nervous or anxious about speaking, or when I come to a business meeting, I can put my ideas on the table without feeling intimidated. That's not what is meant here, but it's rather sampasadana, atano sampasadana. It's, maybe you could call it pacification of mind or clarification of mind. So it has this inner clarification, inner clarity, and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought. And it has rapture and pleasure. It's piti and sukha, born of concentration. And so now the concentration has gotten stronger. So applied thought and sustained thought vanish and they're remains present, this rapture and pleasure, stronger than the rapture and pleasure of the first jhana. Okay, again, he makes the rapture and pleasure born of concentration, drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body, so that there is no part of his whole body not pervaded by the rapture and pleasure born of concentration. Then we have the simile, just as though there were a lake whose waters welled up from below and it had no inflow from east, west, north or south and it would not be replenished from time to time by showers of rain. Okay, there would be a cool font of water at the bottom of the lake and that water would well up from the font into the lake and it would make, and the cool water would drench, steep, fill and pervade the lake so that there would be no part of the whole lake not pervaded by cool water. And so too the bhikkhu makes the rapture and pleasure born of concentration drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body so that there is no part of this whole body not pervaded by the rapture and pleasure born of concentration. It's interesting that we have here another simile which emphasizes coolness. Maybe this is typical of the <laughs> Indian environment where oppressive heat is the problem but perhaps in, <laughs> in North America, during the winter time, we would use, if the Buddha were living here, he would use similes of a kind of delicate warmth pervading the body <laughs> rather than coolness. Okay, so this is the second jhana. Okay, now, before moving on to the third jhana, Again, the meditator has to master the second jhana. It's not enough just to be able to enter it almost by chance, through intense effort, to enter it just for a few minutes. But he has to be able to enter it, to get, to acquire the skill of entering it at will, to remain in it as long as he wants. 
and to emerge, to come out precisely at the time determined. Okay, once he acquires this mastery over the second jhana, he doesn't come to a stop, but he, rec he now recognizes that there are these two factors, rapture and pleasure, which are closely associated in the second jhana. But the quality called rapture in Pali, Piti, has, uh, when one looks at it closely, one sees that it has a certain disturbing quality to it. You know, like, when you feel joyful, even if it's a really wholesome kind of joy, but still the mind, it's not really calm and peaceful not perfectly peaceful, but there's a kind of exhilaration in the mind, a kind of excitement, some degree of excitement. And so after one gets well acquainted with the second jhana, one starts to see that this rapture or exhilaration causes like little ripples on the mind so that the mind is not really perfectly settled. And one knows that there is a state of samadhi in which rapture is absent, but there is still this pleasure or happiness or bliss, and that is the third jhana. And so one reflects on the defect or shortcoming in the second jhana the presence of rapture, and one reflects on the benefit of the third jhana, the bliss without rapture. And then one makes the determination to experience that bliss without any rapture. And so when one's faculties get strong enough, then one goes into the second jhana, and past the second jhana, as rapture falls away, one then enters into the third jhana. And so the text says, again, um, paragraph 17, again, with the fading away as well of rapture, the bhikkhu abides in equanimity, now equanimity, or balance of mind, is becoming more prominent. And mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body, he enters and dwells in the third jhana, on account of which the Noble Ones announce he has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. Okay, so the way we find this third jhana described in the suttas, if you look at the table in the right-hand column, what is absent, what is fallen away, is rapture. And applied thought and sustained thought are also absent. And what is present is equanimity, or mental balance, mindfulness, clear comprehension, and then this pleasure, which is said to be experienced <coughs> by the body. <coughs> okay, then, elaborating, the text says, he makes this pleasure divested of rapture, drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body, so that there is no part of his whole body not pervaded by the pleasure divested of rapture. Then we have the simile 
It's just like there can be, there might be a pond with blue, red, or white lotuses. Then there are some lotuses that are born and grow in the water. They thrive immersed in the water and don't rise out of it. And so that cool water drenches, steeps, fills, and pervades these lotus flowers to their tips and their roots, so there is no part of the lotuses not pervaded by cool water. In the same way, the monk pervades, makes this pleasure divested of rapture, drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body. Okay, so this is the third jhana. Again, this isn't yet the end of the road of samadhi, but there is a state beyond the third jhana, which is called the fourth jhana. And what is distinguished by the fourth jhana is that even this pleasant feeling or blissful feeling falls away and it's replaced by a feeling which is called neither pleasure nor pain. That is, it's a completely tranquil feeling. It's considered the most sublime kind of feeling. And so the meditator first masters the third jhana, then after becoming thoroughly acquainted with the third jhana, he reflects that this pleasant feeling, this blissful feeling, is a little bit dangerous because it's a potential object of attachment. Because the mind sort of becomes attached to bliss. And if one becomes attached to it, then one could fall down into lower states. And one reflects that the state of feeling, which is called neither pleasure nor pain, is more peaceful and more excellent, even than this pleasant, blissful feeling. Then one knows that there is a fourth jhana in which pleasure falls away, replaced by neither pleasant nor painful feeling. And so then one makes the determination to reach the fourth jhana, and then at a certain point, now I'm reading from the text, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a bhikkhu enters and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and has purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. He sits pervading this body with a pure, bright mind, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the pure, bright mind. Then the simile, just as though a man were sitting covered from the head down with a white cloth, so that there would be no part of his whole body not pervaded by the white cloth, so too the monk sits pervading this body with a pure, bright mind, so that there is no part of his whole body not pervaded by the pure, bright mind. Okay, so here we have the fourth jhana, in which the feeling is neither pleasant nor painful feeling, and there is now what is called purity of mindfulness. That is now the mindfulness has become thoroughly purified, very bright and pure, and there is a perfection of equanimity, perfect mental balance. Okay, so this now completes the description of the four jhanas.
And at this point, I'll ask whether there's any questions on the four jhanas. Okay, first, Tracy. Um, yes, um, I'm interested in, in rapture fault. This is purely spectral. First. You're interested in? Uh, how rapture falls away and yeah. mindfulness appears. Yeah. Um, I would assume, my understanding of mindfulness is that reflective quality mm -hmm. yeah. is able to reflect on the deficiencies of yeah. the first jhana, yeah. the second yeah. jhana, yeah. that that reflection yeah. partakes of mindfulness. Yeah. Isn't that mindfulness? Okay, this is a very good point. And actually, for this meditator, mindfulness will be present throughout the whole process, even bringing the stage of abandoning the five hindrances, mindfulness has to be present. In attaining the first jhana, mindfulness is present. The second jhana, too, mindfulness is present. In examining the faults of the lower jhanas, the benefits of the higher jhanas, mindfulness is present. Okay, so mindfulness is present throughout the whole process, but it's mentioned only in connection with the third and fourth jhana, because there, it seems the function of mindfulness becomes more conspicuous or more prominent. So it's not a question of absent before the third jhana, present only with the third jhana, but it's a question of prominence. So its function becomes more prominent in the third jhana. This might be too simple to ask you. Oh, I like simple. Too simple. It might be too simple of a question to ask you, so no, I have yeah. to ask the squirrel us. Yeah. <laughs> but the fourth would be nirvana? That's what no, I'm no, the fourth is not yet nirvana. Okay. Yeah, these are just states of mental concentration. They don't even imply the achievement of the higher wisdom or liberation or nirvana. Now, can anybody that's a layman or even someone like myself who's a beginner, could they, could one even hope to experience something like this? Or is this just something that we would know that someone at your level would 